Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our first daytime Chew in the Loo live. I'm so excited to see all of you. Happy New Year. We've got a great guest. You are very familiar with him. Christopher Kimball of Milk Street Television. Uh, maybe you saw him last year. He was in St. Louis. We had a great time with him. He's been here a couple of times. We're very happy to welcome him back from the comfort of hopefully your living room. So let me tell you a little bit. I'm Amy Shaw. I'm your uh, president and CEO here at Nine PBS. And I hope that you're enjoying the new season of Milk Street. I certainly am. Uh, cooking shows on Nine PBS and Nine PBS Create are second to none. They span diverse cultures and cuisines. And we're still in the premiere season of our local food series, Food is Love with Chef Lasser Sorensen that airs Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. So 2021, it's a fresh start for all of us. And I think you've probably noticed that at 9PBS, we're embracing that fresh start with a new name and a new look. You've probably noticed that new look that launched on Sunday. So it's very new. I want to share why we made that transition. You, you've known us as your local PBS station. So we combined the strong national brand of PBS with our local legacy, Nine's local legacy and our impact to reflect who we really are. Um, oftentimes we found ourselves explaining, you know, we're Nine Network, we're Nine PBS, you know, KETC, Channel Nine. So we're eliminating that need to explain. We are Nine PBS. So we're very pleased to roll that out and uh, uniformly we've heard nothing but praise. So I hope that you're as excited about that as we are. As you know, PBS is one of the most iconic brands in the United States. It's trusted by more Americans than any other brand. That's 17 years running uh, in a Roper poll. And um, at 9PBS, we're an essential and relevant community institution and we're really passionate about making our region strong. Thank you for supporting 9PBS as we continue to share stories that move us, stories that inspire and motivate us, and stories that bring us together as a St. Louis region. Also, as a side note, if you have young children or grandchildren at home, uh, watch 9PBS on weekdays from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. for Teaching in Room 9, where we have a great lineup of local teachers who are uh, teaching on TV. And we've added on-air classrooms in addition to our reading and math. We've added letters and sounds, friends and feelings, movement and arts, all kinds of great stuff. Um, we're all still working at home. This is my living room and uh, we're gonna be there for a while. We're keeping our staff safe and secure. I hope all of you are safe and secure as well. Again, thanks for your support and please help ensure that 9PBS endures as a relevant and essential institution in our community. Go to 9pbs.org slash support and become a member if you aren't one already. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited for today. I'm hungry too, so this timing is great. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the dynamic duo that shepherds Chew in the Loo at 9PBS. Lydia Gwynn, who's our community maven, and Joe Prosperi, our resident foodie and director of digital strategy at 9PBS. Take it away, Joe and Lydia. Have a awesome. great time. Thank, Thank you, you Amy. Amy. So, Lydia, how is your holiday? What did you do? What did you eat? T talk to me. Like, it's been a while since we've had a chew in the loo. You know, I, I want to know what you've been doing. Talk to me. <laughs> All of my juicy details of what I've been eating. Let's, let's begin with, um, I spent a lot of time making cookies. So I feel like at the end of the holiday season, I am a cookie expert. I have I've gotten the science of baking down. Um, not to mention, um, I think my holiday meal at Christmas, which was a beef tenderloin in a herb Parmesan crust with a creamy horseradish was to die for. I think I've topped myself on uh, being able to achieve a really good Christmas dinner. So that one's in the books. Um, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm starting the new year just exploring. It has been great to adventure out and see and revisit some of the amazing St. Louis uh, eateries that we have here. Um, so Joe, I'm going to ask you, since we are here at lunch, tell me about your lunch today. You've been posting amazing pictures the last two days. Um, what was on the docket for today for your lunch? 
So lunch today for me, I, I actually made a uh, barbecued pulled pork uh, yesterday, last night, actually, when I got home. I went to Aldi, bought some uh, big pork roasts and uh, sauced them up and seasoned them up and roasted them for a long time in my giant Le Creuset that I love that I got right before the holidays. And that is my lunch today on some nice potato rolls with some chips. Um, I'm so excited about it. My holidays too, though, have been reading and i'm going to shout out my friend lydia here from her christmas present or birthday present to me i should say this is the flavor thesaurus um, and i literally have been sitting day in and day out and reading all of the different flavor combinations so this has been a wonderful book over the holidays for me as i've been home wanting to explore new flavors and that's why today's chew and live with christopher kimball is going to be so interesting he's going to talk to us about some great ways to add flavor new flavors bold flavors to the food we're making but this book has been great for me it's called the again the flavor thesaurus and you literally can just look up and be like you know what today i'm cooking with peas and you look up peas and it tells you everything that peas go with from a flavor profile so if you're into creating recipes or you're stuck with you know it snows and you've got four things in your pantry and you're like what can i make with a can of tuna a loaf of bread you can look in here and find things that match and find different ways to spice and make your food delicious um and not to mention it's a cool looking book it's got a fun color wheel on it i like it so thank you lydia for that awesome birthday present my pleasure. But it's been a, a it's been a really really busy holiday. Um, we've all been you know stuck at home, but we're going to talk more here about Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Television, um, and we are thrilled about it. We're going to queue up here in just a second the sizzle reel for the current season. Um, you can find the current season on Nine PBS on Saturdays at noon. Again, Saturdays at noon on Nine PBS. You can also catch it on Thursdays at eleven thirty a.m. and seven p.m. on Nine PBS Create. So multiple opportunities to catch this amazing cooking show that really just inspires a lot of us to make our food taste delicious. So I'm going to uh, hang, hand it over to our producer here and have her queue up that video and show us what we're going to see in the, the current season of Milk Street Television. Time for lunch. You know, as we travel the world for Milk Street, we often do not know what to expect. But today we're in Italy, in Bologna, and we know some of the recipes, ragu bolognese, tortellini, and brodo, fried dough, etc. The question is, is that what people are really cooking today in Bologna? To make the truly 100% bolognese with the local meat, local flour, local hex, local pignoletto wine. You have to meet up with this guy, Eduardo Garcia, who cooks the best beans in the world. So we're going to go up an old Aztec canal. It's a very special way of growing beans in Mexico. This is one of the most amazing recipes. There are lots of techniques here too, and also you'll end up being a better cook. The name Vindaloo comes from vin of vinegar and alo, which means garlic. So there's a lot of garlic, there's a lot of tang from the vinegar, and a lot of heat. And whenever you use tomato paste, you really want to cook it. Don't just throw it in and move on. You want to get it so that it gets nice and dark and caramelized. That really brings out the flavor. When you give tips like that, what you're really saying is, Chris. It's for everyone. <laughs> it's for everyone. And especially for me. Toasting is going to bring out a lot of the deeper flavors, as well as nutty aromas. And it will make this a fantastically aromatic cake. I know I'm in Galilee, but where specifically am I here? We're in a town called Drame, which is my father's hometown. And what we found by putting the eggplant on the top like this, it actually steams and it gets very creamy and soft while the rice cooks. And we're going to use a rather aggressive amount of salt. This is a whole cup of kosher salt. Wow. You got to trust me on this one. I, evidently I do, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time I asked you to take a leap of faith. And I'm going to juice this, try not to get it. <laughs> well, I've, I've just been juiced. <laughs> Sorry. Just don't put me in the pot. So welcome. This is Hakarmel Market, which is the main market uh, of uh, Tel Aviv, but of all the central of Israel. Mm. It has everything. It's got a little fat, it's got a little bit of lean. Fabio, grazie mille. I traveled like 7,000 miles to eat these beans. It was worth it. Okay, good. Serve this for dessert, right. and you're a hero. <laughs> There are a lot of things that are easy that don't taste good. <laughs> this is easy and it tastes great. 
<laughs> He's I'm speechless. speechless. <laughs> That's so good. Lahaya. Alessandro, benvenuto a Sevigno. Ciao, carissima. È un grande piacere. We just came back from that um, episode of the new season coming out. I'm really excited about it. I know we were just talking off screen of all the wonderful work that everyone's been doing, but just to take a brief moment, can, can I talk about how incredible your career has been? You spent the last 40 years in publication, not only uh, producing wonderful content, um, um, not only through air, radio waves, but television, you have done numerous publications with magazines, tons of cookbooks. You have a new cookbook out, which I have been milling through and absolutely am in love with. But 40 years worth of amazing talent and information. And now you are here and we are going to mark. Is this your first virtual event? Can we mark well, that no, in? actually, last fall with that book, Cookish, uh, I used to go out on the road and do bookstore events, of course, all over the country. Uh, so I did them virtually this year. Um, which, you know, the, the good news is I didn't have to get on a plane, right? Uh, the bad news is I, I kind of like being with people, you know, in person. Uh, but, but, you know, we all adapted to it and that's sort of where we are. Hopefully by next fall, uh, you know, I can get back on a plane and go out and actually meet people, which would be fun. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you for walking us into your, your uh, you're in the office right now, right? On Milk Street? Yeah, we, uh, we're in downtown Boston. Our entire kitchen crew has been here since uh, May, late May, when it opened up. And uh, I've been here. And so we have about a dozen people out of 45 who are in the office full time. Um, and it's a big office, has very high ceilings. And so we have a lot of safety protocols, but uh, it's been safe. And, um, you know, I, I just can't stand being in the basement of my house anymore. So I, I come to, I come to the office five days a week. Nice. Well, can you give us an inside look of the new season that's coming out or some of the fun things you're working on? Yeah, the fun part for me is when uh, I get to travel, of course. So uh, I went to Israel uh, for this season, uh, the Galilee Valley the, uh, near the Sea of Galilee with Reem Cassis, who wrote The Palestinian Table. Uh, that was fascinating. The food is just amazing. I came down to Tel Aviv, which is an hour and a half away, which is just a totally different world. Uh, and that's fascinating with all the different influences. Uh, I went to Bologna for a week uh, in Northern Italy uh, and was fell in love with Bologna. And it wasn't a very popular tourist destination until a few years ago, but the food was incredible. Uh, I made a ragu bolognese, you know, from scratch and learned how to do it. No cream, no dairy. Uh, and I also went to Mexico. Uh, I had been to Oaxaca. I went to Mexico City. I went down to the uh, the uh, islands in the southern part of the city, and uh, we cooked. Actually, I, I traveled 7,000 miles to cook beans, um, and it was worth every mile of it. Uh, so that, those are some of the things I really enjoyed. And Mexico City is it just has amazing food. It's just an amazing place. So uh, I really fell in love with that. I went to people's homes and cooked and went to restaurants too, but mostly homes. And, you know, I just learned a tremendous amount. Uh, had a great time. So how do you, how do you pick the locations? Is this, do you just at the beginning of a season lay out a map and say, what am I thinking about eating today? And just point to places. Is there a thought process of, of why you pick where you go? Why you pick, like why 7,000 miles for beans? Did somebody tell you about it? Did you read about it? Like what is the thought process that goes into kind of picking? Uh, the, the beans came from Joe Yonan, who's the uh, food editor of the Washington Post, uh, is a friend of mine. And he mentioned to me years ago, he'd been and, and cooked with Eduardo Garcia, had his beans at his restaurant, Maximo Bistro. And uh, so I called him up, Eduardo, and said, look, I hear you got great beans. <laughs> Can I come down and cook them with you? He said, sure. So uh, two weeks later, I got in a plane, went down there. It was very impromptu. Uh, and we went, it's pretty interesting. You go to the southern part of the city and all these old canals, right? You get on a boat for half an hour and get to it, all these islands, these floating islands, Chinampas. And uh, he had a little place there, you know, a little uh, lean-to. And we cooked beans for a few hours over a wood fire and had uh, these humongous bottles of beer, uh, homemade blue port tortillas that we cooked there. And uh, it was fabulous. You know, it was just the, uh, and the beans, I, I make those beans once a month. They're just uh, amazing. 
Yeah, I watched I watched that in the clip and I watched your face just like light up with the light that that these beans yeah. that it was worth the seven thousand mile trek to eat. It was I, I don't want to travel seven thousand miles to make a cheesecake, but I'll I'll travel seven thousand <laughs> miles to make beans. Yeah, no. I don't know if that's a pretty good cheesecake. I mean Yeah, it'd have to be a good uh, cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, so t tell me a about the beans well not, not just the beans but i think that the traveling is just it's part of what makes milk street so incredible i love reading your editor's notes where you talk about the food without borders and just kind of really dive into really the food and the culture behind it and the history behind a lot of the things and and not just that but the spices which really gets me excited so i'm excited to hear that you've been traveling and that that's continuing to go with milk street well, you know, what's interesting to me is I think a lot of people view uh, food around the world as exotic, you know, and I think the takeaway for me with all the travel is that it's just somebody else making dinner some other place in the world. So for them, it's not exotic. It's just what they eat. Right. So if you can get beyond this idea of it being strange or, you know, something you do once a month, um, everyone's just putting food on the table and they welcome you into their home you cook with them. And so you, you get over that barrier of language, you get over the barrier of strange ingredients, uh, and you're just cooking together. Uh, and that's, that's really, for me, the heart of it is, uh, as I said, it's not strange or exotic, it's just food. Uh, and it's, it's their food, but it's kind of everybody's food. And this idea of, you know, food has always been going back 10,000 years, right? Uh, even you have your enemies over for dinner and feed them, you know, food is that welcome. It's what we share. And so I get to sit at a lot of dinner tables with people uh, drinking all sorts of different things and eating different food. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's the commonalities, the common ground. Uh, and that's what's the, you know, I've been at tables with, you know, 20 people just showed up at the last minute or, uh, you know, I cooked with a woman in, in uh, Oaxaca who started crying because she was remembering her mother's version of the recipe. It's a very personal, it's very intimate, but it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, weird. It's not strange. It's it's just food, which I think makes it so wonderful. Just food. I love I love that. Is what when you're going through and you so you've been to these places. You're you're eating these foods. What goes through your mind as you're thinking? Okay, how do I translate this back to mm -hmm. our show? You know, you obviously can't pick up the methods, every ingredient necessarily that they're maybe using in that location. How do you pick and choose? How do you edit it down really for for an American audience um, on Milk Street Television uh, and, yeah. and make it make it accessible so people don't feel like they have to go seven thousand miles for amazing beans so that they can make them in their homes? Yeah, that's the tricky part. I mean. Uh, part of it when you travel is you know what you're going to do when you get there. You have a certain number of recipes you know you're going to get, but uh, you get a whole bunch of other recipes. I was at a place in uh, in Mexico City early in the morning at a market. It was a restaurant in the back of the market, and this woman uh, served us, the chef served us this corn cake. They make it in a blender. It's, it's like a one-bowl cake, and it was a mix between a cake and cornbread. It was amazing. I think it was one of our most popular recipes in the last year. Uh, and it wasn't on the list, you know, but I, I saw the cake. I talked to the baker. Uh, that was an easy thing to translate. Other things are harder, like making scallion pancakes in Taiwan, for, for example. So you really have to, first of all, you have to give credit to the person who taught you, right? And the second thing you have to do is provide the context to say, here's why they do it that way. Then you have to say, okay, you know, you, you don't have this particular spice uh, you're not good. You don't have this particular piece of equipment. So we're going to have to do some adaptation. But in that process, you don't want to lose the, leave, uh, lose the heart and soul of the recipe. So the trick is to keep the fundamental concept intact, uh, but get it, but translate it in a way where people can make it here. And I'd say in the last four years since I founded Milk Street, people's willingness to you know, get another ingredient. You can get any ingredient in 24 hours now, right? It's, it's easy to find. People are more willing to buy different spices. They're more willing to get pomegranate molasses, for example. Uh, and they're more willing to try new things. So I think what's happening like music or architecture or fashion, uh, there's a mashup now. And this idea of everybody having their own cuisine. Well, you go to Mexico City and you can get great Italian food. You know, you can go to, you can go to uh, Turkey and, and get, you know, great Chinese food. So everything's being mixed up together. And I think that's part of the fun of it. 
I was in Tel Aviv and I went to the oldest hummus place uh, and th this, this young kid was running it and he had Mexican hummus, you know, and he had falafel hummus yeah. and he had, uh, you know, Eastern European hummus with cabbage. So, uh, you know, if you go to a place expecting the traditional thing, you're probably going to be disappointed because like in New York or Boston or St. Louis or any other place, people are, you know, they're, they're playing with the food a little. And, and that's, that's, that's the story of food. It changes every day. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, before we talk about the spice clip, which I know that we were all talking about, we we're going to have some spicy conversations today, but we wanted to ask those that are in the audience, if there was any food out there that they would be willing to travel 7,000 miles for. Um, and if so, leave it in the comments so we can see what the desire is for our audience that's out there. And then, you know what, Chris, would you like to introduce the clip that we have going on about the spices? Sure. Yeah, really the foundation of what we do uh, really is sp our spices. Um, the reason is you can get them, uh, they're not expensive. Uh, and America and Northern Europe, you know, was not on the spice road, the Silk Road. Uh, and therefore, you know, we had black pepper, you know, that was coming from uh, uh, Malaysia and other places, uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, a few other things. But if you go to the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire at its height, they used 88 different spices, right? So uh, just knowing how to use spices, increasing your inventory a little bit, it's not expensive. Uh, you know, I just spoke to someone actually uh, about spices uh, from Xi'an cooking. And he said it was about fragrance. It was about depth. You know, it, there's a lot of ways to use spice. It's not about heat. Like in Mexico, chilies aren't about heat. They're about the different flavors, right? So the same thing with spices. They're there to provide layers of flavor. So the, the whole thing we're really interested in, and which is quite different than the cooking I grew up with in New England, is layers of flavor, right? And opposing flavors and sweet and sour and, and creamy and crunchy. And so spices are a really easy way, to, uh, like in Indian cooking, for example, you know, you might cook the spices in ghee at the beginning to, to sort of bring out their flavor. Use the use of spices multi-layered and it's an incredible tool. Uh, you know, Julia Child, the master of French cooking, didn't use many spices. Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. I mean, great food, but not many spices. So spices and herbs are a tool everyone can use and they're game changers. You can completely change uh, a recipe by just using one or two spices in the right way. And then as you get better at it, you start combining them in different ways. So it, it's, it, it's a lot of extra benefit for very little investment. For sure. Fantastic. Well, quick comment here. So we're getting some people commit, commenting and they would go to Vietnam. Someone wants to go get couscous in Morocco. Um, and somebody said, no, I don't want to go anywhere. That's why we have Christopher Kimball. <laughs> so uh, shout out to our audience for for those. Um, so, oh, someone wants to go to France for beef, beef bourguignon. Oh, making me hungry. Okay. So let's go ahead and queue up that spice clip and really kind of dive into the world of spice. You know, at Milk Street, we've learned that you can quickly transform your cooking using spices. So here are some of our favorite tips and techniques for using them. First up, Josh and I discuss how to shop for and also store spices. You know, here at Milk Street, we've learned the hard way that to make cooking easier, if you just start with big flavors, you end up with big flavors without a lot of time and effort and actually technique as well. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is to use spices. So spices can completely change your cooking. You don't need to have dozens of spices. Uh, you know, in Turkey, they might actually have dozens of yeah. spices. In Northern Europe, they might have two spices. And my mother had one, <laughs> which was cinnamon. Uh, but you can actually change your cooking by just using spices, individual spices, or blends. So the first question really is how to buy them. Uh, and so you know, very often I go into a store, there's a big vat of spices, mm. or I go in the supermarket. So, how do you buy spices? Well, whenever you're dealing with spices, you typically want to buy them whole, simply because they have less surface area and they're going to deteriorate at a slower rate. But on top of that, you'll also want to buy them in smaller amounts, so that way you know you're going to use all of them. I know people say six months or mm. something. I, I just uh, take the top off and smell it. And I've had spices, I brought some back from Morocco a few mm. years ago, and after a couple of years, some of those were actually still really 
Right. Oh. So I don't think there's an actual time limit. I think it just depends on no. the spice. Right? Yeah, there's really no one set rule for when a spice will expire. But the number one way to tell, go ahead and toss some of those spices into a dry pan and toast them up. If they become super aromatic, they're good to go, even if you've held on to them for a year. And if they don't, dump them. In the next clip, Josh demonstrates an easy technique, blooming. Now, we like to bloom spices in butter or oil instead of toasting them dry. And this is when you want the fat to help carry the flavor of the spice evenly throughout a dish. We also do this when we're looking to add body to a lean dish, like lentil soup, and also add a final burst of flavor all in one step. Blooming is when you heat spices in a hot fat, be it butter, ghee, or oil. The flavor changes in two different ways. Firstly, there are a lot of the aromas and flavors in the spices that are fat soluble. So as soon as they come in contact with that oil, they'll release those flavors and aromas and really infuse the entire fat with the flavor of the spice. Secondly, the heat from the oil activates a number of chemical reactions, which change the flavors and create new flavor compounds. We love to do this as a finishing touch for our Turkish red lentil soup. And all it takes are two ingredients and two minutes. First things first, we'll add in olive oil to a cool pan and we'll bring that up to temperature over medium heat. And we'll swirl that olive oil in the pan just to coat the interior. And to that, we will then add in Aleppo pepper. We'll swirl that around again. And once this oil takes on that bright red color of the Aleppo pepper and becomes extremely aromatic, we're ready to pull this off the heat and use as our finishing touch on our Turkish red lentil soup. In season four of Milk Street Television, I traveled to the Galilee Valley and cooked with Reem Cassis. She's the author of The Palestinian Table. She showed me how her family makes spice blends and also uses them for easy weeknight meals. What are we cooking today? So we're cooking uh, chicken and potato bake. Very mm -hmm. simple, it's spiced with allspice, olive oil, my mother's ninth spice mixture. You know, the, the idea of a tray bake is something I heard just recently, about a mm -hmm. year ago from Nigella Lawson. Yeah. But I guess it's not really an English thing because we're here in a Palestinian kitchen and you're doing tray bakes. We call it suniye or sawani, plural, just literally means tray. Families have their own spice right. mixtures. It's not like there's one, you know, ras al or something. No, no. So you have a nine spice mixture. What, what's in that? Pimento, allspice, cinnamon. There's nutmeg, there's mace, there's cloves, there's cardamom, there's cumin, there's coriander, and black pepper. I mean, this is richly colored. It looks great. Well, let's try it and see if it tastes as good as it looks. So these are all legs, so the meat should be juicier than juicy. You can't overcook it. I love the crispy skin. Let me get you some nice crispy potatoes as well. Do you want me to show you how I do it? Mm-hmm. You mean squeezing the garlic? I just squeeze it out. And then it's kind of like your own sauce. Mmm. Great flavor. There's no pre-cooking. Mm -mm. There's the marinating of the chicken. Throw in the oven, you're done. And also the chicken doesn't overcook. So let's say you have company coming and they're late. You just, you keep the oven on, but at a lower heat, it'll be fine because of the juices. It'll keep it moist. Mm -hmm. And even on a weeknight, yeah. super quick. You come home from work, you throw it in and within an hour, it's done. You know, years ago, I swore I would never do baked chicken parts again. But every time I swear off something, I ended up doing it anyway. So when I was visiting Reem Cassis in the Galilee Valley, she made a tray bake, which just means on a sheet pan, and it was unbelievably good. Uh, and it was because her family has a spice mix with nine different spices, and she roasts these whole spices every couple of months and keeps them fresh and uses it on everything. So the takeaway here is make your own spice mix, and, and she puts it on everything. And it's just this go-to way to take something as boring as baked chicken parts and turns them into something. I, I made it for Christmas, actually. It's just Great, and you've made it recently. Right? I've made it a bunch of times. It's part of my repertoire. It's our favorite kind of recipe, right? It's simple, but packs a ton of flavor. Yeah. And a lot of that is because of this really great spice blend. And that's what we're gonna make here. So we have nine 
Beautiful. Nine, count them. <laughs> They're beautiful spices. We're using whole spices that we're going to toast and then grind ourselves. That's the best way to get a lot of flavor out of your spices. We have allspice, we have black pepper, cardamom pods, we have coriander, cinnamon sticks that we broke in half, uh, cumin seed, some cloves, nutmeg. It's a piece of nutmeg that's just kind of cut in half. And then we have blades of mace. And this is something that's kind of unusual. You don't see it very often. Typically we find ground mace. So if you can't find blades of mace, you can just add ground mace to your spice blend after it's already ground up. So I'm gonna put these in a cool skillet. And we do that when we toast spices so that we don't overcook them and burn them. So I'm just gonna drop all these guys in here. Well, you wanted to say a word about why we're starting with whole spices? So we're using whole spices here. We are allowed to toast them in the pan. We get a lot of flavor out of it. We're gonna grind them ourselves. And then you can keep this spice blend for up to three months. We're gonna make probably about a cup of this. Whole spices that you toast and turn into ground spices is about 20 times better than <laughs> buying ground spices at the supermarket. Yes. Yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna turn this on over low to medium heat. Again, we don't want these spices to burn. So we're gonna toast these really just until we can smell them. And then you wanna immediately take them out of the pan and let them cool. We wanna make sure that they're cool before we put them in the grinder. Some of the steam that comes off that can affect its texture and flavor. So I have all those spices that we toasted. They cooled, they're in this spice grinder. We're gonna grind them up. All right, smells amazing. Wow. It's so different than if you just put a bunch of ground spices in a bowl, wouldn't have this amazing smell to it. So look at this meal on a sheet tray. It looks beautiful, am I right? And you did not lie because the garlic is not over roasted. It's beautifully browned yeah. right yeah. there in its little safe haven. Yeah. So I'm gonna take the chicken and the potatoes off. The skin is actually really nice and brown. You can still smell all of those spices. Well, this is sort of like spatchcocking a chicken, right? I mean, you're cooking it in mm -hmm. one layer, so the white and dark meat, yeah, you don't have to really worry great. about. So as I said, we're gonna make a really great simple pan sauce right here on the sheet tray. Oh, this is juicy. Oh. This is like when I first had it with Reem Cassis, I was going like, you know, baked chicken parts. <laughs> I didn't quite get it. And then I took a taste, it was like, it was just amazing. And I've made this dish many times. So it's a little ode to homemade spice mixes. Exactly. Right? Today we want to talk about an ingredient, and then we're going to make a recipe called seared pork tenderloin with smoked paprika and oregano. But it's all about the smoked paprika. So this is Pimenton de la Vera. This comes from Spain, of course, uh, in between Madrid and Portugal in a valley. And it's very different than, let's say, Hungarian paprika. That are dried peppers, uh, dried with fans and, and heaters. Uh, this is an area that's actually fairly rainy. So they do this over a wood fire. They don't do sun-dried. And they do it for a week to two weeks. So it's a very slow process. They don't want the heat to get over 120 degrees because that'll cook the peppers. So if you smell this, it's very, very, very smoky. It's a totally different product. Uh, and it's one of those things that they would use on any dish. You know, migas, which is the scrambled eggs with the ham, just put it on top of almost anything. So it's one of those game changer uh, ingredients that requires very little work, but just adds a ton of flavor. So we'll start with uh, some olive oil. Uh, we have dried oregano. Uh, we have the pimenton de la vera, which is the smoked paprika, and a little bit of sugar. Now, in lots of cultures, uh, even here at Milk Street, a lot of recipes start by toasting spices in oil or dry toasting them in a skillet. Smoked paprika, pimenton, has so much flavor and so much smokiness, you don't really do that. So we'll be brushing this on right at the end of cooking. We're not gonna start by uh, brushing this on the meat uh, at the beginning. We're gonna brush each side with a little bit of the sauce. You can really smell that smoked paprika. Comes right off the pan.
The four halves are cooked and they're on a platter. We have a little bit of this remaining sauce on top. And we're just gonna let this sit for five minutes. So now it's resting, we have a little bit of fresh oregano. Thick piece. So that looks great. Uh, it's a nice thin piece of pork tenderloin, not overcooked. Mm. You know, it's amazing how just a small amount of smoked paprika just flavors an entire dish. It's delicious. So this is a great example of what we love best here at Milk Street. Take a sort of plain thing like pork tenderloin. Uh, it cooks very quickly, but that smoked paprika, which is really the essential ingredient here, just adds so much flavor. So you transform something common into something extraordinary with just essentially one ingredient. So seared pork tenderloin with smoked paprika and fresh oregano uh, is a great Tuesday night dinner or any night of the week. I hope you've learned a few new tips that will change the way you cook. Now you can get to work in your own kitchens and improve just about anything with the use of spices. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, so we are back with Christopher Kimball. Um, all that that stuff is just so so fascinating to look at um, and hear about with the spices. I mean, so many of us think that a spice is something you grab off the shelf and you shake it in. I think to to watch that clip and realize that that single spices can be used in multiple different ways. You, you can bloom them in oil, you can toast them, you get them whole and you grind them. There's not, you don't just go and get uh, paprika off the shelf and, sh and shake it on. There's different ways you can utilize all that. And I think it's just so fascinating to, to know kind of the science of all that and ways to go about that. So such a fantastic clip from your show. I think we're gonna dive in now really to some questions about spice to really relate to our audience. We've got almost 150 people on here. And I encourage you guys that are, uh, um, watching at home to start tossing out your questions about spices for Mr. Christopher Kimball here. Um, you know, you've got a, a master chef, a master of flavor here. So don't hold back, ask what questions you've got. And we're going to really tap into that brain of his and that knowledge. And I'm going to start off with a question that many of us are probably thinking. And really what I'm thinking is, so I want to cook more and I want to try new flavors. If I'm going to my local grocery store, what do I do? Like there's a huge aisle, there's all of these spices that are there, there's, you know, hundreds of choices. What am I looking for if you're going to give advice to somebody on being a little more explorative with their cooking and with spices? What's the first step I would take at a, just a local grocery store, um, you know, not looking to go too crazy, but something that's easily accessible for me to kind of get my feet wet? Do we have an hour to answer this? How, much, how many hours do we have? Um, I have the rest of the afternoon. Um, I do think that the first question, the first thing I have to say is you probably would want to consider, especially with some of these ingredients, not buying it from your local store. Um, you know, fish sauce is one of those things that is not fishy if it's good. It just adds umami flavor. Uh, a really good soy sauce is just totally different than what you're going to find in most supermarkets. Uh, pomegranate molasses, uh, good spices. So you you can go to your local supermarket. A uh, gochujang, I mean, the, the, the bad stuff is fermented in two days. It has lots of chemicals in it. The good stuff takes years to ferment. Uh, some of it's 10 years old. Uh, it's a totally different experience. So it's not a lot more money, but you might want to consider getting the better quality product. That aside, yeah, here's a few spices. Smoked paprika, pimenton, you should get. Uh, that's it can be used in so many things. It's just a great, great game changer. Uh, sitar, if you can find that, which is a mix of wild thyme and, and sesame seeds, etc. cetera. Uh, cardamom, coriander, fresh cumin. Uh, buy seeds if you can, whole spices. Uh, and you toast them in a skillet for a couple of minutes until they start to become aromatic. Let them cool down and grind them in a little spice grinder or mortar or pestle you'll find the flavors two or three times as good. Uh, and that's really a great trick. In terms of fermented sauce, as I said, soy sauce, fish sauce, mirin, uh, pomegranate molasses, there were some of the things you could keep around. Black vinegar from Chinese cooking is really helpful. Uh, and, and just get a good vinegar, you know? A lot of vinegars are just not very good. 
and getting a good vinegar is great. A white balsamic, I think, is really terrific. Um, I use actually a, uh, it's based on sour calamansi vinegar. It's sour orange. We actually sell it in our store, but if you can find that, that you can make a salad dressing with that and everyone thinks you're a genius, you know, so that's, that's easy to do. <laughs> um, you know, and, and getting some chili paste, you know, uh, are, are really helpful, keeping a few of those around. Harissa is a chili vinegar tomato paste uh, from North Africa. That's great. So I'd say if you targeted maybe 12 items, four spices, uh, four fermented sauces, four chilies and paste, you know, maybe you're going to spend 70 bucks or something. I don't know, $100, but that would be a good beginning. So let's let's talk real quick. You, you threw out a lot, but a lot of those are centralized in certain cuisines. So maybe if we're being adventurous, we buy more spices. Is there a certain cuisine you would say, I would start with Indian or Mediterranean, which is a great avenue to start looking at if we're looking at cookbooks or looking at cuisines to look. To well, make? first of all, I think the mistake sometimes is people think uh, in a, you know cumin from India, for example is also all over the Middle East or molasses can be used in any beef stew. So the, the trick is you can take ingredients from a particular cuisine, lemongrass, whatever you want, and use it in a variety of applications. That's the first. Secondly, I think the Middle East, which is this huge area in terms of food, uh, every, every household does it differently. But I think that food translates to the American table very well. Uh, they certainly do use a lot of spice. Um, so I, in Northern Indian food, which is what we're used to here, not so much the South or Goa, et cetera, uh, a lot of that food, uh, you know, the, the classic restaurant dishes like butter chicken and things translate well. But I think the Middle East uh, is very approachable for people and teaches you a lot about using spice in, in, a, in, a, in layers of flavor. And then let's talk real quick. Oh, sorry, Joe. Um, I've, I've had some friends, we've had some conversations on True in the Loo about people having to cut salt out and that a good substitute for cutting salt is to substitute more spice to get that flavor. Is there any recommendations on like good go-tos to try to help balance out sort of the lack of salt? Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, salt, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, salt and pepper, I've always said they should get a divorce because pepper is a spice. Salt's not a spice, salt's salt yeah. uh, and enhances flavor. So uh, if you don't have salt, yeah, you could use, you know, vinegar, you could use ginger, you could use spices, you could do all those things. Uh, and if you absolutely can't use salt, uh, that's fine. I, I would point out that 95% of our salt consumption does not come from home cooking. It comes from prepared foods, it comes from supermarket ingredients, it comes from restaurant food. So you're really not getting that much salt if you think about it. If you make a soup for eight people and you have two teaspoons of salt, in it or whatever it is, it's you're really not getting that much proportion. So I, I would check with your doctor to make sure that, you know, whether actually a, a typical home cooked meal, you're actually getting that much, you know, if you can't get any, again, you're gonna have to go down that route, the road of all those big flavors. Uh, but, you know, chili paste obviously have salt in them. So you'll have to avoid those. But salt is is one of those things that it's it's pretty hard to, you can't really substitute for it. Right. Uh, you, you can work around it with big flavors, but uh, you, so salt gives you that foundation under everything, just enhances everything. It's like MSG, right? MSG, right. which is used by cooks all over the world, by the way, and they think it's just fine. Uh, it's a flavor enhancer. So you are the second. You are the second uh, chef that we have had on a Chew in the Loo live that has told us that about MSG. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a good. Uh, a, a well, good it's, it's not in most places in the world. MSG is not, you know, it's not a joke. It's not yeah. like some horrible chemical. They just use it in their cooking, and uh, it does enhance flavor. Now, you know, in those little cubes. You know, I was in um, Dakar, in Senegal a couple of years ago, and in the market they have people who just sell like 10 different kinds of these. And while they're making, um, you know, a lot of their dishes, uh, like Tiboudien, which is, uh, you know, a sort of smoked seafood stew, uh, they'll just throw a couple of those in. Uh, and it's just, you know, that just is how they cook. Fantastic. Yeah, Quitron, who uh, oh, is the owner and chef uh, at Mai Lee 
and uh, Noodle House here in St. Louis gave us a, a really great talk about, about using MSG and those umami flavors and, and the role that it plays in your cooking. So um, that's fantastic stuff. So you had mentioned that going to uh, the grocery store is probably not the best place to get your spices. How, where do you, how do you recommend acquiring them? Do you buy them in bulk? Do you buy them in small amounts? Do you go to a specialty food store, a spice store? Like if you're gathering these things, talk to us about what that shopping looks like now that you've named some of the actual spices and flavors to use. Um, you know, how, how do we uh, take them? Do we store them in the cabinet? What, what, how do we take care of those spices? Uh, first of all, I would, uh, I, I did buy spices in bulk years ago. Uh, and three years later, I still had bulk spices. <laughs> so uh, that's a really terrible idea. You want to buy really small quantities. Uh, now, certain things like cumin you use more often, right, than other things. Uh, but you want to have fairly small quality uh, quantities. I would go to a place online uh, you trust and, and does, does a good job of that. Um, I will say, though, uh, years ago I was in Morocco, and I, you know, I was south of the Atlas Mountains. It's desert. Uh, and the spices were just amazing. Uh, and I brought them back. And two years later, they were still vibrant. So I'm not sure about the six month rule. I, I think the rule is take the top off, smell it. <laughs> you know, if it still has a great flavor, uh, uh, odor, aroma to it, then it's fine. But a, a small quantities at a time and purchase from a, a good source. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get decent spices in a supermarket. Some supermarkets probably have good spices now. Uh, but the trick is just to smell it. I mean, if you have a bottle of cumin and you open the top and it doesn't blow your head off, you know, th then it's not good cumin. It's got to have a real depth of flavor. And as I said, buying whole spices will last longer than ground. And uh, you just heat them up for a couple of minutes in a skillet to cool them and then grind them. Uh, even a, you know, an old spice or mediocre spice will be much better that way. Now, if memory serves me correct, your Milk Street online, you have curated an incredible pantry store for people to be able to, to purchase a lot of these great things that you've mentioned, along with some other great ones. That, that calamansi vinegar is mm -hmm. amazing. I yeah. bought it from my friend that's Filipino and she lost her mind. She It's incredible, the flavor in it. Um, so a lot of the things you're talking about, you've already curated in Milk Street, um, correct? Yeah, I didn't want to turn this into an ad for our <laughs> online store. I was I was trying to be you know, a gentleman and a scholar. It's okay, uh, I'll do that for you. Okay, you can do that. Uh, well, the reason is when we travel, we come across ingredients or tools and stuff. And we said, well, why don't we, you know, a lot of, a lot of people don't have access to the U.S. market, right? Because they don't produce that much. I have a Lebanon, a guy in Lebanon, uh, I was there a couple of years ago, and this olive oil was, you know, yellow and cloudy and free. It didn't have that bite. And uh, we went through about a quart of it in, in one day. And I said, where'd you get it? And he told me. And so I, we get we get that olive oil. Uh, and the guy only, you know, has so many olive trees. So um, that's we started to do that. And I'd say most of what we get, a large percentage of what we get is probably not available know too much uh, here so um and there's so many small mom and pop folks you know uh there's a woman who makes these great sauces from africa uh the cambodian black pepper and those spices uh, a lot of people making their own sauces or making their own uh, masalas or their mo or chars or whatever so uh it's really fun it's, and we get to taste it here you know so that's fun mm -hmm. uh but you know you don't have to go to us there's plenty of people online who sell things so Sure. Um, the, I think the secret is, you know, going to a big provider online store, it's sort of hard to tell what to buy. And very often the really good stuff isn't there because they don't, they don't have enough volume to get onto a big platform. Sure. So you really want to get the small producer, you know, who's been doing this. It's all organic. It's all natural. Uh, it's just, it, there's a, we just got two things I love, a, a lemongrass paste. You know, lemongrass mm -hmm. is a pain. Yeah. to find yeah. and work with it's really hard <laughs> it is. Uh, and also i we got these jars of this mango these wonderful mangoes i think it's from india these mangoes and it's just a puree of the mango there's nothing else in it uh oh, things like that are just wonderful we got a pistachio spread from uh italy uh, pistachio pistachio i guess it's called pistachiosa and uh it's it's like a nut butter but it's pistachios uh and that 
I have found myself late at night with the refrigerator door open with a spoon, you know, just having a couple spoonfuls. So there's some great stuff out there. You know, you can go, you can find it lots of places, some of this stuff. Yeah. It's just great. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about a lot of great spices that you would recommend. I think we do have to ask, which spice do you think is totally overrated, that's overused and could kind of take a break? I, I think they should take all the cinnamon in the world and put it on a boat and sink it. Uh, <laughs> and and not, not because I don't like cinnamon, but, you know, cinnamon will ruin an apple pie. It will absolutely destroy it because apples have a subtle flavor. A great apple pie use three or four different types of apples like they used to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just made a great apple pie for Thanksgiving with, I just got all these heirloom apples from a local orchard and made it. And I didn't put any spice in it, you know, not too much sugar. Uh, and that's about it, a little lemon. So uh, cinnamon is so overpowering. Now in Greece, for example, they might use a little cinnamon in a tomato sauce. So when you use cinnamon in the Middle East, uh, every family has their spice blend and cinnamon and, and other things like that are sort of part of the warming spices. So I think it's great if it's used in conjunction with other things in modest amounts. But I think with English cooking in particular, Northern European cooking, some American cooking, cinnamon was the big bold spice and it just blows everything else out of the water. So uh, be very careful. Uh, and there's also true cinnamon versus what we get, which has got a more floral uh, sort of interesting uh, flavor, which is nice, but I, I, it's, it's overused. I think I made that point. Yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great question that we got from one of our, our audience members. I got another one here from them. Um, well, two questions, really. One is, what is what is an umami spice? What spices do you recommend? We'll really kind of talk about the umami flavor and, and what spices can easily bring some of that to the table. Well, some of the things you have, tomato paste has umami, Parmesan rind, for example, if you throw that into a super stew, that has a lot of umami. Um, you know, other things, uh, other things that have it. Fish sauce is like pure umami. I, I just, I mentioned fish sauce again, but if you get the good stuff, like uh, the stuff at the bottom of the barrel and the after a year and the anchovies, uh, it's not really fishy. And it's, it, you just use a little bit of it and you don't really know it's there, but it has a great, uh, great umami. So that's also, and you know, sometimes if I'm making a stew, for example, I'll take a couple of anchovies, you know, from a jar or can and, and throw them into the oil. They dissolve into the oil and then I saute the onions. You, you don't notice a fishy taste, but it just adds a lot of umami flavor. I, I will say though, that I think fermented and umami are often overdone. Um, you know, some cuisines are like in the Ukraine, there's a ton of fermented food and South Korea is a ton of fermented food. I think uh, I like a little more balance sometimes. So uh, you can have too much. I mean, like you mentioned beef bourguignon. Uh, beef bourguignon is, you know, an umami bomb. It was five pounds of meat and it's got this and that and you brown the meat. I mean, I think uh, in a lot of cuisines, uh, meat is, is a flavoring. It's not the main thing, right? Yeah. So I think having a nice mix of things and umami is, is balanced by something else is really an interesting way to go. I love that. I love that. Okay. A second question we got from someone is talk about maybe a, a, what good things go into a good harissa. Uh, that's a good question. You know, uh, originally you, you'd have the peppers. Uh, you might have vinegar, of course. You might have a little tomato, but a lot of it was salt, vinegar, and peppers. It was very plain. And if you're talking about North Africa. Uh, Paula Wolfert did a recipe where she had uh, sun-dried tomatoes in it, which added some sweetness. S and you can get uh, some of the ones I've gotten hold of also have like apricot harissa or they have smoked. They have different flavors. I find the best harissas have a little bit of sweetness. So that apricot harissa, the sun-dried tomatoes, I, I like something to offset the heat and the strength of the chili rather than just full blast heat uh, in vinegar. I like that offsetting sweetness with a tomato. So I like the balance. So I, th that would be my favorite. So we've talked about harissa, we've talked about some lemongrass paste, and I think it's kind of, um, can we talk about storage of those? Like how to prolong the life of them? You know, would you recommend freezing or refrigerating any spices? 
uh, spices don't, if they're whole spices, just keep them in a jar in a, you know, cool, a cool dark space, as they say, you don't have to freeze them. Uh, grains and flowers, I have a whole refrigerator in my basement that's basically grains and flour storage. Uh, like whole wheat flour will go bad in a few months. So uh, that, that you do have to keep there. And the paste, uh, the paste keep a long time in the fridge. Uh, that's really no problem. The only thing you do have to worry about, as I said, are grains and flowers. Those are the things that tend to go bad uh, the quickest. So real quick, and I'm shamefully going to also talk about, like we've talked about how spices, and sometimes we assume them to be umami or savory, but sometimes we don't, we need to think about the other end of it when we talk about sweet. Um, and I have been blown away by the, the sugar mixtures that you guys have put together, um, the coffee sugars, and I've used them in my cuisine too, but I never would have thought like chipotle chilies and chocolate and vanilla and sugar. Are there spices that you would recommend that go better on the sweet side than maybe on the savory? Well, in the Middle East, uh, if you get coffee, uh, they put cardamom in it. Uh, they brew it with cardamom. Uh, and that's, we actually developed a flavor based on that. So that's, you know, that's typical. Uh, Mexican hot chocolate, you know, has, you know, has chili in it, of course. Uh, and so you can do that as, as a, as with sugar for coffee as well. Um, I think, I think the secret is in most places in the world, they combine sweet and savory, right? So main courses tend to have something sweet in it. Uh, and so whether it's that dried fruit or it's actually something sweet like honey, uh, they balance savory and sweet nicely. And the, and the reverse is true that in desserts, uh, you might add something bitter or you might add something savory. For example, uh, rye flour is often used now. I was at a bakery in East London a couple of years ago and um, she made a lot of her uh, baked goods with rye flour because it's slightly bitter. Uh, we make a chocolate chip cookie here that uses some rye flour and boy, it's so good because it's not over sweet, right? It's sweet, but you have that bitterness. So I would say if you add something savory to your sweets is really interesting. The flour is a good place to start. So sub out a third of your all purpose flour with rye flour. Uh, and that, that makes a big difference. That's really a, a good trick. Well, we're getting, we're getting close to time, but I got one last question, which is what is the last thing that you ate that surprised you? Um, the last thing I ate that surprised me, well, two things. We've been making chocolate cake every day uh, from a bakery back in the day, bakery in Savannah. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has quite a lot of sugar in it. Uh, but it is, it's a full tilt American chocolate cake. And I, I looked at the recipe and now I didn't see anything uh, at first that surprised me, but it's just the right mix of ingredients and it is terrific. I just had some potatoes from Portugal uh, we were working on and they, they braised the potatoes on top of the stove with wine and some herbs and some spices. Uh, and that was a totally different take. It was braised potatoes, but there were liquid sauce around them uh, and that was uh, really tremendous as well. So I think that those are the ends of the spectrum. I got potatoes on one hand and this massive piece of chocolate cake, which right after this session, I get to test again. You know, I, I get to say every day, you know, that chocolate cake was pretty good, but we should make it again tomorrow. You know, that's a rough day at the office. <laughs> I, you know, no one has any sympathy for me in my <laughs> Absolutely not. You know. <laughs> Well, before you go, we have one last thing to announce to our audience. So Christopher Kimball and Milk Street Television have been very generous to us here at Chew and the Lou and 9PBS. They have given us a whole bunch of coupon codes for free cooking classes, virtual cooking classes from Milk Street Television and their studios. They offer them online. There's one every couple of days on all sorts of really great topics. We have 50 of those to give away to you guys. So I'm gonna tell you guys how to earn one of those free cooking class uh, vouchers that you can sign up for. There's a whole list online on their website. Um, and there's gonna be two ways for you to do that. So we're gonna give 10 of them away to the first 10 people that go on to the Chew in the Loop Facebook group and take a picture of, uh, thank you, Lydia, for showing it, um, take a picture of their favorite spice from their spice cabinet and share a picture of that with an explanation of what it is and how you use it with the Chew in the Loop group. I'll now, Joe, I, I think that we need to make sure that we're clarifying that like black pepper doesn't count, guys. Let's get adventurous with these spices. Let's, let's see what you have in there. If you've got that paprika, show that. Let's get Don't excited and adventurous. 
I don't want to see garlic salt. But I will show, and it may be kind of cheating to do spice blends, but my big spice right now is Trader Joe's Mushroom and Company Multipurpose Umami Blend. It's got a lot of different things in it, but this is one that I've used on a variety of different meats. Um, it's done me really, really well. And also they have at Trader Joe's and everything but the elote seasoning that goes really good on popcorn and really good on eggs, scrambled eggs. Um, so they're kind of cheating because of their blends and they've got a bunch of extra stuff in them. Um, it's not it's not a great toasted thing, but if you're looking for something easy and flavorful and new, these are my, these would be my go-tos that I would take a picture of right now. Next week, it may be different because I got to go to a spice store now that Mr. Kimball here has inspired me to branch out further beyond Trader Joe's spice rack. Um, but that's going to be how we're going to give away our first 10. So go to your spice rack, find a picture of your favorite spice and tell us about it. The other 40 coupons we're going to give away by doing what we've done multiple times on Shoe in the Loo, which is invite ask you guys to invite people to be a part of our community. We have almost 2,000 people on our social media channels on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook that are following Chew in the Loo, having food conversations. Like this week, we're talking, it's National Pizza Week, so we're asking you guys to share pictures of your pizzas that you have taken. Um, that you're eating, that you're ordering. I had a great pizza last night from Pie Pizzeria. Um, the meats of pizza with a nice cornmeal crust, deep dish, some real spicy tomatoes on top. It was fantastic. So take pictures of your pizza for National Pizza Week. But in order to earn one of these coupons for a class from Milk Street Television, you need to invite people to Chew in the Loo. We have the ability to see on the back end, if you click on the invite next to somebody's name, that uh, we can see when they join who invited them. So the first 40 people that uh, have somebody that joins Chew in the Loo because they were invited by you, I will message you with one of the coupons for one of those classes. And again, there's really great stuff. There's beginner classes, like 75 minute class on I just want to start cooking. What do I do? But there's also a great hour long class on how to use anchovies. Like, so we got these big ideas and you've got very small direct concepts classes on there. So lots of great ideas, lots of neat things to explore there from Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Television and all the associated stuff. So Lydia, anything you want to add here before we kind of sign off and say thank you to our audience? I just want to tell Chris, thank you so much uh, for, for all of your expertise today. And not only that, but I'm shamelessly also going to say like visit his online store because he has picked up some amazing, incredible spices. Uh, he talks a lot about that fish sauce. Your fish sauce is really, it's incredible. It is so good. So I'll shamelessly promote Milk Street because it is, you have done an amazing job curating that online store for your home pantry. I know that that was my Christmas shopping for myself was <laughs> going to town. Um, so thank you, Chris, for everything that you've done um, to not for that Milk Street brand. No, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. I'll echo and that. Next time, time in person. person. Next time in person, Def, we'll take you up on that one. Reminder, you can find Milk Street Television on 9PBS on Saturdays at noon. Also on Thursdays on 9PBS Create at 11.30 or 7 p.m. Catch that new season that is currently airing right now. We thank you guys all for being a part of the Chew and Lou community. Usually, this is our first daytime one of these. So usually Lydia and I have a glass of wine that we toast to our, our guest yeah. with. Um, not today, because it's the middle of the work day and my boss is watching, so I can't really do that. But we'll still toast with my coffee here. Lydia's got water. To Mr. Christopher Kimball, cheers to you. Thank you for you. joining us today, inspiring our Chew and Lou audience and, and being just an awesome chef and cook and um, inspirer of tasty things. So thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys all. Everyone thank have you. a great day. We'll see you on Chew and Lou. Have a great day, Chew Crew.